Well, good morning, friends, and welcome to Wellvest. Uh, lovely to be with you, as always. And as always, a prayer from me that what we do this morning will give glory to God and draw us a little closer to Him. And so I'm moving on. We're in Romans, of course. I'm in chapter 1 today from verse 18 to 32. This has been a fairly difficult one to do because it deals with God's wrath or God's anger. And I don't think we ever enjoy hearing things like this. But I pray that that as we work through it, we will find a blessing that God has for us. So it's Romans chapter 1 and from verse 18 through to verse 32. Let me read it. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all this godlessness and wickedness of people who suppress the truth by their wickedness, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that people are without excuse. For although they knew God, They neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made to look like human beings and birds and animals and reptiles. Therefore God gave them over in the sinful desires of their hearts to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie, and worshipped and served created things rather than the Creator, who is forever praised. Amen. Because of this, God gave them over to shameful lusts. Even their women exchanged natural sexual relations for unnatural ones. In the same way, the men also abandoned natural relations with women and were inflamed with lust for one another. Men committed shameful acts with other men and received in themselves the due penalty for their error. Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they would do what ought not to be done. They have become filled with every kind of wickedness, evil, greed and depravity. They are full of envy, murder, strife and deceit and malice. They are gossips, slanderers, God-haters, insolent, arrogant and boastful. They invent ways of doing things evil. They disobey their parents. They have no understanding, no fidelity, no love, no mercy. Although they know God's righteous decree that those who do such things deserve death, they do not only continue to do these very things, but also approve of those who practice them. My friends, I hope you're praying for me as I continue from what I've just read you. Because, yeah, it's it's not one of the easiest passages to work with. And I pray that I will just do some justice to it. Please, God, let it not come over judgmental. Last week was easy because we spoke about the power of the gospel and God's love. But this is about godlessness and wickedness or refusal to acknowledge and worship a true God. Godlessness, if you like, is putting me, man, that is, in first place before God. Trusting in oneself rather than God for guidance and leadership in our lives. could be said that all our sins and unrighteousness springs from godlessness. Now, these are very judgmental words, my friends, and I'm asking you just to be gracious, allow this to progress, and and I hope that we'll come to something worthwhile. God's power and divinity is everywhere around us, if you look around. Look around you, my friends. Look at the mountains, the stars. Only God can make what we've got around us. And I'm looking at verses 21, 22, and 23 here. We all, even if we deny it, can see God's qualities, mountains, stars, and so on and so on. So why do so many of us deny God's existence? Verse 24, 25, 26. And what can God do? Well, you know what he does if you read these three verses? He leaves us alone. Three times he does this. Three times? Does the word three ring a bell? For us, three times in these verses, 24, 25, 26, God leaves us alone to do our thing, if you like. The problem is that the more we sin, the further we draw away from God. Verse 24 says that he gave us over to our sinful lives. Verse 25 is about idols. It's about 
created things becoming more important to us than God. What car do you drive? What suburb do you live in? You know, how big is your bank account? What sort of job have we got? It's all about created things. It's all about me and us. Perhaps idol worship is the number one sin against a true God. What or who comes before God in my life? What comes before God in your life? Because these are the things that separate us. In other words, this is what Paul is trying to get at with the Romans. He's trying to wake them up, and he's doing it pretty forcefully, trying to wake them up to the fact that we put things in our lives before God. And he's trying to say to us, think about it. What comes first in my life? What comes first in your life? Who comes first in my life, in your life? So let's, just for a moment, what is an idol? Idols are not just metal or stone or wood, but anything we love more than God. Anything or anyone we love more than God. That's an idol. Money, possessions, fame, power, honor, even family. These are very hard and harsh verses to reflect on, my friends. I do hope you're being gracious with me as I try my best here. Verses 26 and 27 deals with homosexuality, and that's definitely a topic for another day. But verse 28 says this, Furthermore, just as they did not think it worthwhile to retain the knowledge of God, so God gave them over to a depraved mind so that they do what ought not to be done. Our first sin is to worship anything before God. The scary thought that in all our sinful thoughts and desires that are in our mind, when we drift away from God, other things begin to take over. Other thoughts begin to manifest themselves in our lives. And verses 29 through to 31 is an example of the various sins, the scary things that all of us have in us somewhere. And only the blood of Jesus, and this is the good news, my friends, only the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross can cleanse us from our sin. You know, I've painted a pretty dark picture this morning about our sinfulness and allowing ourselves to be diverted from our main love. But only the blood of Jesus shed for us on the cross can cleanse us from our sins. It's not what we do. It's what Jesus did that is important. Do you not think that in the light of what I've just said, it's imperative to seek God's forgiveness and love and acceptance and mercy on a daily basis? Do you not think that maybe this is the number one priority for us to do what we're doing right now? To seek God first. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all the other things will be added to you. doesn't come easier than that. Think. Think. It's imperative. It's imperative for us that we understand how much God loves us. You know, we hear the words, your sins are forgiven. For me, I want to suggest that these words, Derek, or whatever your name is, your sins are forgiven, are probably the most wonderful words we'll ever hear. Can I say this to you, my friends, who are hearing me this morning? In the name of God and as his spokesperson, he is saying to us, your sins are forgiven. I can only think of one thing to do, and that is that I need to renew my commitment to my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right now again because it's the very best and only thing that I can do because it's not what I do. It's what Jesus has done. If we can hold just this one thought this morning, I think we've got it, my friends. It's not what we do. It's what he did, has done. May it be so. May we just hold on to this as we go back into our world this morning. Why not renew our commitment 
to Jesus Christ even in this moment. Come, let's pray. Oh, Father God, it's so easy to speak the words, but but it cost you the life of your son. It cost you everything that was precious to you to help us understand how much you love us. Father, may it be that the words we've heard this morning remind us of the love that you have for us so deep and so special that you prepare to even sacrifice your own flesh and blood. Oh God, what a wonderful, wonderful God you are. What a gracious, glorious Savior you are. What an amazing friend you are by your Spirit. Please come and fill us again, right now, so that we can just put aside the things that separate us from you and receive you as Lord and Savior of our lives once again. Thank you, Father, for all that you are in our lives. We pray your blessing on us now as we go back into our world and into our activities for the day. Go with us, Lord, not just today, but always, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Please go and have a wonderful day, my friends, and I pray that what we've done this morning will be a source of encouragement and blessing for us. Have a wonderful day. God bless you.